Welcome to session nine of the Sea Power Conference. Um, this afternoon, this afternoon's panel um, is uh, somewhat different than what we had anticipated. We've lost a couple of speakers, um, uh, but we're going to proceed um, with the, with those that we have and um, and an addition. Um, this afternoon's panel consists of uh, Rear Admiral Chris Smith, uh, Mr. Tony Dalton, uh, Mr. Justin Hayhurst and uh, Rear Admiral Justin Jones, who has uh, offered to stand in and supplement this afternoon. Um, questions will be taken at the end of the session as well, uh, uh, using the Indo-Pacific 2022 app, uh, so I, I'd encourage you to, uh, uh, to use that. Um, uh, Admiral Smith is going to chair the session this afternoon, and uh, Sir, would you like to take the floor? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to session nine, the maritime domain of the Indo-Pacific, a commonality of purpose. When framing the utility of naval forces, the American strategist, Edward Lutwak, stated that naval forces are like all forms of military power, only more so. The familiar attributes, inherent mobility, tactical flexibility, and wide geographical reach render a Navy particularly useful as instruments of policy in the absence of hostilities. The great Australian historian and strategist, T.B. Miller, was also alive to Australia's geography and observed that the first point to remember is that Australia is not a continent, but that it is an island, and underline the strategic challenges for defence. Miller states plainly that any hostile power does not need to invade Australia. They need merely to control the archipelagic sea lanes that Australia relies upon for its global trade and prosperity. In 2017, the Naval Shipbuilding Plan asserted that Australia is a maritime nation and our security depends on a modern and effective Navy. This investment will ensure protection of our maritime borders, secure our immediate northern approaches and the proximate sea lines of communication and enable us to project force in the maritime environment. This session will review, examine and evaluate the Australian ecosystem approach to its maritime domain and maritime capability and consider the inputs of foreign policy, industry, education and small business to the delivery of security and prosperity through a whole of government lens. As mentioned, we've got a slightly changed lineup today, uh, but all speakers have got great experience uh, in this area and will bring some interesting views. Initially, I'd like to ask Mr. Tony Dalton to come up and conduct the initial keynote address. Mr. Dalton is the Deputy Secretary of National Naval Shipbuilding. He is responsible for National Naval Shipbuilding within the Capability Acquisition and Sustainment Group in the Department of Defence. He comes to this job after a long career in the Navy where he was most recently responsible for the delivery of shipbuilding programs, including the Hunter-class frigate and the Arafura-class offshore patrol vessel. Previously, Tony served as the project director for Navy aviation projects within the Defence Material Organisation, the Director General Naval Aviation Systems and the Head of Helicopter Systems Division. Tony. He left out the best part, the first 20 years as a naval aviator. And there's no irony in, in the fact that a naval aviator is now responsible for delivering all of Navy's ships and submarines. Uh, and I'll just have a chat to you today about some of those aspects. Um, so really, I'm responsible for the naval shipbuilding enterprise. And we want to talk a little bit today about commonality of purpose. Well, the naval shipbuilding enterprise is all about commonality of purpose. That common purpose that draws us all together about how do we deliver on the government's intent to create continuous naval shipbuilding at the same time as delivering potent naval capability into the hands of our Navy. Um, so that enterprise itself is uh, the enterprise word is the key part about how we view that commonality of purpose, that, that unifying activity that brings us all together. And we are treating it as a whole enterprise. So that's from our end users, the sailors that go down to the sea in ships and will continue to go down to the sea in ships for generations to come, all the way through to the industrial base that has to deliver that capability. So when we look at how that enterprise actually fits together, how do we actually create 
an enterprise out of a series of projects and move away from the old shipbuilding programs that we had in Australia that were definitely boom and bust. So we'd build a, a shipbuilding program, we would build the Anzac class frigates and then nothing would follow on behind it and the industrial base would erode and atrophy uh, and then at the next program we would then have to restart that whole process again and there's a premium to be paid for doing that. So the enterprise approach is a very deliberate process where we want to take um, all the programs that are lined up into the future and look at them in a way where we can create continuous naval shipbuilding. Now there will be an inherent tension in that because the end user might want the ships earlier, sometimes our strategic circumstances might change and we're seeing some of that happen as we speak and we'll look at how the enterprise can adapt to deliver on those new challenges. But the trick is to treat it still as an enterprise. That allows us to do lots of other things. So there's a whole bunch of sector firsts that we're actually achieving in the naval shipbuilding enterprise. And one of the ones about that is a really coordinated approach with industry, with academia, with our vocational education and training partners about how do we set up the enterprise for success. With our primes, with our prime contractors, we have now worked, um, and for the very first time in Australia, our prime contractors have all agreed to share their workforce demand data. Now that's a really big step. Normally this is data that's held quite closely inside these companies, and they have all agreed to share it. That means that we have a very granular view of what the workforce demand is across the enterprise for the next 10 years and beyond. That allows us to use the levers of government and the whole of government is involved in the enterprise. And I can go into education and help set policy that will deliver the supply side to that workforce requirement. They're the really big changes. We've also agreed across the entire sector a common job taxonomy. So we describe all the jobs the same way across the entire enterprise. And that allows us to actually compare apples with apples. It allows people to translate between programs far more easily as we, as we do that. Uh, and then the part about the enterprise that we most are focused on is you know, why do we want to build ships in Australia? And the real key reason for wanting to build ships in Australia is to create a sovereign sustainment capability. And that's the end goal for the whole process, is to be able to operate the ships that we own in a sovereign way, unfettered by external pressures, as much as we can possibly do that. Now, in the shipbuilding side of it, about 60% of all the dollars we spend in shipbuilding are actually spent in Australia. In sustainment, about 80% of all the dollars we spend are actually spent in Australia. And we spend a significant amount of money in sustainment. Right now, the naval sustainment budget is around about $2 billion a year. Over the next decade, that will grow and will double in size. Um, so there's significant investment in sustainment. And in fact, right now, what we spend annually in sustainment is more than what we spend annually in acquisition. As our programs ramp up a little bit, that will change. Um, but right now, we're spending more money in sustainment. So when we look at the whole enterprise, what we're trying to do is bring that all together. Um, we have set up an organisation that helps us do that from an in industry side. The Naval Shipbuilding College, which is a bit of a misnomer, it's not really a college, there's no bricks and mortars and they're not actually teaching people things. But they're actually working with our academic institutions to make sure that the degrees that people study at university are tailored towards shipbuilding. That the vocational education that happens with welders, with boilermakers, is tailored towards the shipbuilding outcomes. And once those courses are accredited, then all of the industry will accept that qualification as part of the entry pro process into the enterprise. So these are really kind of groundbreaking things. They, are, they do involve all of government. Um, and we, we actually pull all that together to create that enterprise view. And again, as the theme suggests, a commonality of purpose. And that really does help us focus on all of those activities. So that's the, that's the real key part of that message. I think as we move through the process, as, uh, as Chris said, 
The Naval Shipbuilding Plan was published in 2017. It was built around four key programs. Um, and we've seen those programs grow. And we've also seen the government adapt to our changing circumstances. And that has affected one of those key programs. So the attack class submarine program, you would have realised last year, um, the government has made the decision to move forward with nuclear powered submarines. And that has created a little bit of turbulence in the workforce and in the enterprise. But the remarkable thing about the enterprise is over that period of time, how much resilience we have built into it. And I think resilience from that industrial base is a really important aspect, again, of commonality of purpose. I, uh, I, I quite often um, reflect on the public narrative around the shipbuilding enterprise. Um, and over the last two years, we've all lived through the global COVID pandemic. And uh, it's great to be here and see people in the flesh. Um, but we're not out of it by any means. But there's a different level of acceptance across our community around the impacts of COVID. For most of us, if you think about going out to buy a new car or a smart TV, you have to wait. Um, I, I, was, I was speaking to a chap yesterday who's just ordered a new V8 Mustang. Um, it will arrive next February. Uh, and that seems to be OK. Um, we all accept that COVID has impacted some of those industries in different ways. And you know, the availability of chips and all of those things that go towards manufacturing cars, um, we, we go, OK, well, if I want my V8 Mustang, I'm happy to wait until next February. I have 11 months delay in one of my offshore patrol vessel programs. Uh, I think that is a remarkable story that we've, over the course of the pandemic, that we have contained the impact to a relatively small delay. That demonstrates remarkable resilience across the enterprise, remarkable resilience across the industry. Uh, but the narrative quite often doesn't reflect that in a, in a way, and I'm, I'm OK with that. But I, I do think it's important that we do recognise that the commonality of purpose across our industry, the commonality that you get when you bring together people in an enterprise approach to business does actually generate positive outcomes. And that resilience that we can see across the shipbuilding enterprise at the moment is a reflection of that. So I think there's, while there's definitely challenges and what we do is, uh, is not for the faint hearted, the shipbuilding enterprise itself is working. It is demonstrating that resilience. It is demonstrating what you get when you have a commonality of purpose. And I'll probably leave it at that, Chris. Thank you, Tony. Um, your, your description of the scope of the shipbuilding uh, and, importantly, the sustainment enterprise in Australia uh, has really highlighted the breadth and uh, not just the breadth, but the depth of that enterprise across our Australian landscape. And uh, it's an enormous undertaking in which will take in a whole bunch uh, of industry, academia and all other aspects uh, and uh, really a national effort. And you're right, uh, how we've been able to manage that through COVID is quite remarkable and it's a shame that on occasions, we don't uh, necessarily get the credit for the great work that you and your team do. Uh, next, we'll move to, to Mr. Justin Hayhurst. Um, Mr. Hayhurst is the Deputy Secretary of the Geostrategic Group in the Department of Foreign Affairs. Prior to assuming the position of Deputy Secretary, Mr. Hayhurst was First Assistant Secretary, International Division, Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. He was lead drafter of Australia's 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper, and First Assistant Secretary in the Foreign Policy White Paper Task Force 2016 to 2017. Justin. Thanks, uh, Rear Admiral. Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to start just by acknowledging the traditional custodians uh, of the land here that we're meeting on the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I want to acknowledge uh, the contribution they make to the region and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. I'm really glad to be here to talk about this, these important issues, including, I suppose, from a foreign policy point of view, not just diplomacy, but 
integrated statecraft more broadly. Uh, Australia and our partners, we face a complicated external environment, including in the maritime domain. And one thing I think that is clear is that responses to that environment aren't just security responses. We need other tools as well to respond uh, and shape. I think there's sort of, at a simple level, there's three things that uh, foreign policy needs to do, uh, or three factors that you need to think about with foreign policy. Of course, governments, and we've got an election at the moment, will decide the exact policy formulations, but there's three buckets of issues. One of them is your domestic capability and power and resilience and cohesion. So that's about the economy, it's about your military capability, it's about your other security tools. Uh, the more effective that is, the more you can use that, the better off you'll be as a state. Same with your partners. So you've got to think about that aspect. Second one is a balance of power question, how that works, how power is distributed and exercised in the world. Clearly, uh, naval power is central to that. There's no serious country that has strategic ambitions or a strategic vision that doesn't have naval capabilities. The fastest growing power in the world, arguably China, the one that's shifting and changing the strategic environment, is investing, as all growing powers have, in extensive naval capabilities. So the distribution of power, we've got to think about that. How do we respond to it and shape it through defence, through statecraft, through diplomacy, through other means. And the last thing that I think about, um, it's really about the regional order or the global order, the rules of the road, international law, norms, those intangibles, or as the government said in 2017 in its foreign policy white paper, the thing that matters to Australia is not just how power is distributed, it's also the character of the regional order. Is it open? Is it law-based? Is it power-based? Is it democratic? Is it non-democratic? Is it market-based? That stuff. So we've got to think about those three things. I don't need to sort of belabour the points about the maritime dimensions to all of this for a country like Australia. Three oceans, a region bound and connected by sea lanes, an alliance partner of the United States with critical lines of communication, trading nation, uh, a nation that seeks its future in a region where power uh, and rules are being contested including in the maritime domain, like in the South China Sea. The other thing, of course, though, and this applies to Australia and our partners in the Pacific and Southeast Asia, is maritime issues are more than just military and power equations. There's also depleted fisheries, illegal fishing, piracy, environmental threats. We've got to respond to them all. An Australian agenda for the Indo-Pacific that doesn't have tools to respond to those issues um, and cannot make a contribution won't be very effective. So the bottom line for me is we need a multi-dimensional response to these challenges. Defence's strategic update talks about shaping, deterring and responding. That makes sense. Um, the Foreign Minister of Australia talks about resilience, relationships and rules. Um, the Shadow Foreign Minister talks about power and influence, uh, regional relationships and the US alliance. The one fundamental truth for Australia, and this conference bears it out, but it comes through in lots of other ways, is that, of course, Australia has agency and capabilities and power, but we can't achieve our objectives on our own, clearly, only through partnerships alliances, cooperation, can we hope to shape the region and protect our vital interests. So these partnerships are enablers of Australia's security and prosperity, uh, and that you know, is the business of the department that I represent. So maritime domain, big problems, multifaceted, multidimensional ones, we have different tools for different tasks. AUKUS, for example, it's about high-end capability and hard power to contribute to deterrence. 
That means Australia can make a bigger contribution to regional security. Maritime capacity building in regions, whether it's in fisheries or in the defence domain, or supporting the sustainable use of marine resources, that matters too. We need an integrated response. Uh, the other thing, of course, that we need to do is fortify the rules which support uh, good order at sea, as it says here in my notes. UNCLOS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, having the rules and then having the capability to use and exercise those rules. So when I think of Australia maintaining a strong operational presence, obviously it relies on our capability and our power, but we're operating in international waters or um, in the air according to international law. We've got to do the both things together. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, or DFAT for short, that's what we do together with Defence and other agencies. So we support defence operations. We enable them. Uh, we support, enable and sometimes fund um, ABF, Australian Border Force, Maritime Command, work with regional partners to build their capacity. The Australian Fisheries Management Authority is important. The Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment, CSIRO, our sort of peak research institution. We work with them through our development program to help our partners tackle illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing. We do that in Timor, we do that in the Pacific, we do that in Southeast Asia. We support, fund and enable the Pacific Island Forum Fisheries Agency to protect the fisheries and the sovereign rights of our Pacific partners. Those states, small island states to some, large ocean states to themselves, um, need support from their partners, I think, to build that capacity and combat IUU fishing. It's got some positive results already. So we're, we're starting to manage tuna stocks more sustainably. Uh, we've got community fisheries plans in Kiribati, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. That goes hand in glove with our defence partnerships to build the regional order that we want. Um, so when you think about defence's contribution, 21 Guardian class patrol boats, that's part of it, but there are other tools as well. Same in Southeast Asia. We're doing it in Indonesia. We have a maritime cooperation plan of action. We train other governments and share expertise and learn from them about applying the law of the sea and about managing and mapping our own marine resources. Our work with India, growing an influential partner, is influential in defence and non-defence terms when we think about our oceans. And when we think about Australia's diplomacy and policy to the South China Sea, for example, this is where the law and the rules come into it. We seek to protect and promote a rules-based system. And what happens there matters not only to the countries uh, of the immediate region or to the whole Indo-Pacific, but globally. You know, there's no, from our point of view in Australia, there's no insiders and outsiders on these matters. International waterways, the global commons, what matters there affects, you know, what, what happens there affects us all, matters to us all. So, from Australia's point of view, building that capacity, standing for those principles, working with partners, shaping, influencing, that is an integrated agenda and that is something we've got to get right. Just by way of concluding, I just want to go back to, to those two fundamental points. There's the stuff at home, well we won't talk about that now, but power and how it's distributed, that's what we need to get right, but then it's the character of the order. And that's what integrated statecraft means, being able to work on both of them. Different governments will have different points of emphasis, but fundamentally, that's the task facing Australia. So on that note, thanks very much for the invitation and uh, I look forward to further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Justin, uh, for highlighting that global influences uh, have an impact on our national responses and uh, others actually have a say. And uh, your ability to highlight the complexity of that domestically uh, um, was fantastic. I look forward to some of the questions that will roll out of there. Uh, for our third speaker today, um, this one uh, we called up with 10 minutes notice, so I do appreciate uh, Justin coming forward. Rear Admiral Justin Jones, uh, extensive uh, seagoing career within the Navy, which uh, 
uh, culminated in commands of uh, the guided missile frigate Newcastle and uh, the tanker success. Uh, Justin has also uh, had roles ashore as the director of the Sea Power Centre, uh, Commodore Training, uh, J3 in our Joint Operations Command and is currently the commander of the Maritime Border Command, uh, integrating and bringing together uh, many of the things that we've been talking about today so far. So thank you for joining us at late notice, Justin, and uh, I invite you to the mic. Thanks, Chris, and uh, so apologies in advance if this seems uh, somewhat unconstructed, but um, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, Maritime Border Command is not a Coast Guard, but it is as close as one can get to a conception of a Coast Guard in Australia. I want to describe to you what it is, because for many here it won't be that familiar. Um, but commonality of purpose is foremost in our minds in Maritime Border Command. Uh, it is an operationally, it is the operational arm of an operationally independent uh, command within the Department of Home Affairs, i.e. I report to the Commissioner of the Australian Border Force. Maritime Border Command brings together people, assets and contracted assets from the Australian Border Force, the Australian Defence Force, all three services, the Australian Federal Police, the National Intelligence Community, public servants, liaison officers, and a strong international network. Um, we are responsible for Australia's civil maritime security. Now, what does that mean? Civil maritime security advances and protects Australia's interests by actively managing non-military risks to Australia and Australia's maritime domain. Let me just uh, frame the problem for you for a moment. Uh, I think everyone understands how vast our maritime zones are, uh, and you're probably familiar with some of the diagrams uh, going around. Uh, let me offer you, some, offer you some other statistics drawn from the very recently published Australian Government Civil Maritime Security Strategy. Uh, you're probably all aware that Australia's area of maritime domain and interest covers 10% of the Earth's surface. Now, that, that is our search and rescue region. Uh, commensurate with that is our security forces area, uh, for which Maritime Command, the Maritime Border Command is responsible. Around 70% of Australia's jurisdiction lies beneath the ocean surface. 45% of our national waters are marine protected areas. Over 80% of Australia's trade transits through our maritime domain, with $1.2 billion worth of trade moving through Australian seaports every day. Six out of 10 of Australia's top attractions are aquatic or coastal attractions. And Australia was the world's eighth largest international tourism market in 2019. Australia's ocean economy is predicted to contribute $100 billion per annum to Australia's economy by 2025. Our oceans and coasts provide an estimated $25 billion worth of essential ecosystem services, such as carbon dioxide absorption, nutrient cycling and coastal protection. Renewable ocean-based energy is estimated to contribute up to 11% of Australia's total electricity generation by 2050. And our civil maritime security activities are critical for disrupting criminal organisations. In 2018, 2019 in particular, 72% of amphetamine type stimulants, 83% of cannabis and 72% of cocaine were imported to Australia by sea. That's the problem set. What are the threats within that? Uh, the declared eight civil maritime security threats that we work to in Maritime Border Command are illegal activity in protected areas, illegal exploitation of natural resources, marine pollution, prohibited imports and exports, unauthorised maritime arrivals, compromise to biosecurity, piracy, robbery or violence at sea, 
and maritime terrorism. Now, does anyone here think that I can do that with five patrol boats, five AVF patrol boats, half a dozen aircraft across that vast area? Uh, well, this is where commonality of purpose comes in. We work with, uh, across the whole of government to achieve that important civil maritime security mission. So here are some of the departments that we work with on almost a daily basis in Maritime Border Command. The Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, the Department of Defence, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And Justin just made a great point about international norms. It is just as important for us to be working as far forward or as far advanced from the problem set as we can. So we work closely with our posts overseas, whether they have ABF liaison officers or not in those posts. Uh, Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. The Department of Infrastructure and Transport. How do you think we get fuel to Christmas Island or Cocos Island? The Australian Fisheries Management Authority, who has responsibility for managing the Australian fishery. The Australian Maritime Safety Authority, states, territories. Uh, I don't command any of those, and I don't have any authorities over any of those. So my greatest lever we have in achieving our mission of civil maritime security is a commonality of purpose, uh, what we refer to as the Team Australia approach. Um, it, it is a big problem, and a big problem set that I've described, and there is no way that uh, one small entity that we are can, can possibly achieve what we are supposed to achieve without bringing together uh, all arms of the government, all tools of statecraft, um, even for civil maritime security, as much as we might think about military maritime security. Uh, so I appeal to the narrative, the brand, uh, for the Simon Sinek fans out there, the why, understanding the why of what we do is uh, the best tool I have to galvanise the whole of government contribution to civil maritime security uh, for us to achieve what we need to achieve. I'll leave it there and you can tackle me on questions afterwards. Thank you very much uh, for presenting uh, yet another lens in which to view the maritime security and also the challenges of generating the commonality of purpose that we spoke about. Uh, that concludes the formal speaking part uh, as we go forward. So. Uh, We'll have a number of questions rolling through now. They've already started to come through. So if you do have any questions there, please uh, push those through on the app and, and we'll tackle them as we go forward. The first, que first question that's come through uh, for, for Justin Hayhurst. Uh, how do you see the relationship between China and the Solomon Islands? If the China-Solomon Islands relationship comes to be stronger, how might Australia respond constructively what events might raise to the level of a red line? Nice easy one to warm up. Uh, not very well canvassed or known about publicly, so a little obscure to some. Um, look, I think it's pretty clear from the comments on the record from ministers that uh, Australia, and indeed the opposition, that Australia has concerns about that agreement, uh, principally relating to uh, the transparency or lack thereof behind it, uh, and also the potential effect on regional security and the fact that it uh, has an impact uh, beyond the purely bilateral. The other thing, though, that's very clear throughout commentary uh, from Australian officials, ministers and the opposition is a strong focus on the sovereign uh, capacity of Solomon Islands and, and its sovereign right to make decisions in its own security. I'm not going to go into the red line business, but the bottom line for Australia is clearly it's an important partner. It's a country that's relatively near our shores by Australian standards. We have a long history of support and partnership on security, internal, development, 
uh, labour mobility and the stronger that partnership is, the more we work on its capacity and the more we work regionally in the Pacific, through the Pacific Island Forum, the more we're going to have effective security responses to security challenges. All countries in the world are obviously going to trade and engage with China, uh, the world's largest economy, the world's largest trading nation. This is really, though, about the effectiveness of Pacific responses to Pacific problems by Pacific Island Forum members. I think that's, um, I think that's as far as I'll go right now on that. Thank you. Uh, the next question to Tony Dalton, noting the UK's Indo-Pacific tilt, how will the Hunter Class program enhance Australia's relationship with the Royal Navy? Of all the challenges we must overcome to make the Hunters a success, what is the largest challenge in your view? All right. Uh, so I'd start off with um, the Hunter Class frigate is based on the Global Combat Ship reference design. Um, that is now a reference design that serves both the Royal Navy and the Royal Canadian Navy, who are also a Pacific Ocean Navy. So the, the, the commonality there across those three platforms does enhance our ability to work more closely with both the Royal Navy and, and the Royal Canadian Navy, and to be able to support each other um, into the future from, from Australia if that's required. Certainly in a sustainment sense, we'll be able to support the Royal Navy and the Canadian Navy quite easily should they visit our area. Um, so I think that is a positive outcome. Uh, we'll build on a whole range of sensors in, that, in those ships that we share and the training that will come from it. So I think in those sensors we can see a very positive outcome by sharing those capabilities. The building of the Hunter Class Frigate is uh, is like I said earlier on, not for the shipbuilding, is not for the faint-hearted. Um, there are a number of challenges going through that. Some of it um, we've already seen with um, some delays emerging in that program. Um, that delay, you know, I think you can contribute to a number of things, but I would, for, for certainly for the Australian audience, talk a little bit about COVID. Um, while we are, you know, living in, a, in the new kind of COVID normal environment, um, Australia had a reasonably um, straightforward experience with COVID, being an island nation and being able to s learn lessons from the world as the COVID pandemic migrated across the planet, we were able to control COVID in a way that some other countries didn't quite get the same opportunities to do. Um, where the Type 26 is being designed in Scotland, um, their COVID experience was very different to ours. 10,000 people died of COVID in Scotland. Um, that's a number that Australians really don't quite grasp most of the time. The design office in Scottsdale in Scotland was shut down for four months. You can't do ship design on your home computer. So those things did impact our program uh, and we are making our way through it. From an Australian perspective, the biggest risk is going to always be the strategic human resource risk. How do we build the skilled workforce um, and scale it in time to actually be able to get that program running smoothly? Um, the government has invested significantly in infrastructure. We've built a state-of-the-art digital shipyard at Osborne, an investment of over $530 million uh, in that, and we're running prototype blocks through that shipyard now, demonstrating how efficient that shipyard will be. So I've got a great confidence that once we start building the ships, we'll be able to build them efficiently, effectively, um, and uh, in a way that we'll be able to meet the Navy's requirements. Yeah, thank you. And for those uh, young junior officers out there, I walked over uh, Glasgow late last year uh, and it is a impressive vessel and the opportunities for us to work together in developing the mission systems, the concept of operating uh, and a range of other aspects of that vessel, which will be a centre of a network, not just a platform in our historical view of a frigate will provide opportunities for um, the Royal Navy, the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Australian Navy to work together uh, and with a commonality of purpose to ensure that we can enhance that capability uh, for global operations. It's a very exciting time in that platform. Uh, staying with you, Tony, uh, what is the relationship between the shipbuilding enterprise and the nuclear-powered submarine enterprise? Uh, well, look, the, uh, Australia is... Uh 
is embarking on a on a an ambitious and I've heard it actually said a few times audacious shipbuilding program um, that includes now you know at least eight nuclear powered submarines. Um, I often talk about scale um, when we when we when we talk a little bit about some of these programs and especially in relationship to in relation to AUKUS. Um, there's 330 million Americans. Right? There are 70 million Brits, and there are about 26 million Australians. So scale matters. And when we talk about trying to integrate the nuclear-powered submarine program into the Australian context, it has to be viewed in, inside the context of the enterprise, that commonality of purpose. Um, how do we make sure that industry can scale to support this new program? And the way to do that is to actually have that enterprise approach to it. Um, Admiral Meade is working through um, a process. He's in many ways trying to climb Mount Everest without oxygen um, because it's such a big task over the rest of this year. Uh, and he's, his team will work tri trilaterally with our partners in the United States and the United Kingdom to develop the optimal pathway for Australia to deliver that nuclear-powered submarine. And how they fit into the enterprise is absolutely part of what Admiral Meade's program is doing and we'll support him in that Herculean task um, as he takes that back to government next year. Um, so they will absolutely be part of the enterprise. A little bit how they deliver that will still be probably dependent on what the optimal pathway looks like um, and we'll work through that uh, over the next uh, little while as we develop the, that optimal pathway. Thank you. And uh, next we'll go to uh, Admiral Jones. Uh, noting that the Mar Maritime Border Force advances the Australian civil interests, that is to say protects the national nation against crime, what are the challenges which arise from the appointment of a naval officer in command? None that I'm aware of. <laughs> I, I'm actually a sworn Australian Border Force officer as well, although they, they won't give me a badge. I'm a bit disappointed about that. Uh, I kind of come back to my point about commonality of purpose. Uh, so it has traditionally been a position that has been uh, staffed by uh, a seconded naval officer uh, who is a sworn ABF officer. And uh, uh, I've, I've outlined you know, what, what Maritime Border Command is comprised of in terms of, of people and agencies that contribute. Uh, I'm fairly new in the job. Um, to be sure, but uh, I, I've not seen any real challenges yet from, uh, from the appointment of, of a naval officer in, in command of that entity. And one that's a more broader question to the panel, so uh, if you're happy to get the talking stick there, Justin, we might start with you and move down. How might Australia use the Navy better as an instrument of statecraft in the Indo-Pacific? Oh, that's a that's a pretty big question. We, we are doing, I think, as much with our Navy. I'm going to draw on uh, two years' experience in Joint Operations Command prior to my current role. And we are doing about as much with our Navy as one can possibly do with the resources we have, that is, people, platforms, money, time. Um, we're, about, we're doing as much as we can, I think. We're getting uh, exceptional bang for buck out of our Navy. It's being worked hard. Justin? Um, it is a big question. It is a big question. Uh, I think, you know, the answer I'm going there's, there's two ways of thinking about this, of course. If the environment deteriorates so much, you're on the verge of conflict, you get one sort of answer. In the environment we're in now, um, presence, visibility, and a regional focus, they're the key things. Our Navy has often, as my fellow panellists will know better than me, been deployed in other theatres, to use a military term, but now uh, the Indo-Pacific is front and centre of Australia's strategic agenda, um, and our alliances and partnerships are about shaping the Indo-Pacific, so there's a regional focus. Then we've got to be present and visible to partners, some of whom uh, are smaller states than Australia, um, some of them larger. All of them, I think, to a degree, have questions about, some are anxious about, some are confident about the future. So is Australia a partner that's present, active, 
uh, working closely with them. That's the sort of a test we want to we want to get right. Um, if things go awry, then it's a different answer, I'm afraid. Yeah, I think from a you know from an enterprise perspective, you know, our role is to make sure that we have a navy that goes to sea, um, and I think how you influence the region that you're in is by being at sea. Um, and so a lot of what we do is making sure that the Navy has the capabilities that it needs when it needs it and they're fit for the purpose that Navy requires. And we do have a Navy that goes to sea. We spend a lot of time at sea. Uh, and that's a real bonus and that does shape the Indo-Pacific in which we're in. We also use elements of the enterprise itself to work really closely with our Pacific Island partners. Um, and, uh, and Justin touched on the Guardian class patrol boat program. Um, we're about 14 boats into a 21 boat program and those boats are being gifted by the Government of Australia to our Pacific Island partners to help them grow their own security environment. Uh, and we do that in a way that's not just not parting, passing the boats to them, but continuing to provide that ongoing support. We provide the training. We have the, uh, a great TAFE service now in Cairns, in Queensland, that helps grow that capacity through with our Pacific Island partners. And I think that's a great way of, of demonstrating that we are more than a fair weather friend. We are a partner in, in the Pacific um, that's there to actually help that Pacific Island family that we're a part of. Yeah, I think I'll extend in the international engagement, which is one of my uh, the hats I wear. I, I look at uh, uh, our Navy. Our Navy doesn't operate alone. Um, it works in a joint force. Uh, it works in a whole of government environment. But, but more importantly, when you look at the region, uh, we, we operate uh, with a coalition of partners and friends. Uh, many of those coalition of partner and friends live in different parts of our region. Each of those will have a perspective on what is important to them. And if you talk to our friends in the Pacific, um, climate change and these other issues that are a, a direct result of that uh, are, are a very high priority there. If you look at other parts of the region, um, then security around maritime resources uh, and aspects of that will become very important as well. So I think from a perspective of a Navy, we need to understand the part we play in the broader joint force in the whole of government. We are a tool that is used as, as part of, but not as an end state uh, in its own right. We need to understand our partners and friends. We need to understand what is important to them. And when we do work with them and deal with them, we do so in a way that's mutually beneficial and it's not just something that reflects what our desires are in that space. And I think also importantly, moving to the point that was made around the capability of the ships themselves and what the Navy does, we need to be able to build partnerships regionally where we can operate together. And when we do operate together, we reflect the rules-based order. Uh, we reflect the desired outcomes and behaviours that we want within our region collectively. So it continues to reinforce exactly what it is is important to us as a nation, and we go back to the character of behaviour that Justin spoke about earlier, and ensure that what we do reflects uh, those priorities uh, and those principles, and we work out ways that we can build the relationships with our partners and friends here, uh, and work together to increase our capacity to ensure that we do have that uh, stability going forward. We've just been informed that that's uh, the last question there. I thank you very much for the input that uh, people have uh, provided. I I'd like uh, you all to join me in thanking uh, the panel who have done a fabulous job of uh, illuminating the breadth and depth of uh, a commonality of purpose, the many lenses in which we can look at it. And I think that uh, every time I've been to one of these panel sessions, uh, the diversity of thoughts and views has really highlighted to me that uh, collectively we need to come together and spend more time listening than speaking, understanding the views of others, and we'll come out with much better outcomes both uh, here in Australia and uh, in the broader region. So please thank the panel who uh, done a great job. Thank you.